So what can you tell the fans about the the new record, All Hell's Breaking Loose, out June 30th? Well, I can tell you one thing, that Go For The Gold is the last song on the album. Yeah. And the so first, there's, and the there's single nine too. equally ass-kicking, crazy songs <laughs> right before it. So we made sure of that. That was the mission statement. It was 10 songs, 35 to 40 minutes, no let up, bang, 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 bang. So when you hear it, it's like when we were kids, when we heard Van Halen one, and when we heard Montrose and, you know, st stuff like that, and you wanted to play it again. And it, it has more impact that way, you know. Uh, you know, we'll leave Pink Floyd to Pink Floyd, you know. <laughs> They're great at it. We do our thing. That's, that's cool, you know. Yeah, definitely. And I love it. It's crazy how you guys are putting out music this good in, like, 2023. You know, where there's bands that started in the 90s that can't even touch, like, stuff for their earlier stuff. But you guys, your whole thing has always been to top your earlier records. And, and you can yeah, totally I mean, I, hear I it. I think we've been, on that, we've been on that train now for about, oh, God. At the very least, since, since we came back from Mark's accident and we did Walk Through Fire, that was like a plant the flag, boom, we're here. Let's see yeah. where we go from here. And we've we've topped it every time, which yeah. is brilliant. We're very happy with that. That's always been the thing. Like, do is the greatest thing you can. And then it's like, okay, we've set ourselves a real target here. How are we going to up it? And we have. Metal City, was. Uh, we were very happy with it. It was, uh, you know, probably the best album we've done up to that point. This one is better. That's our view, at least. Uh and if everyone else comes along for the ride, that's brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's awesome to hear and super exciting because uh, you guys always just put out such amazing music. Now, I do want to go back in time a little bit, and I hope I'm not going too far No, back. no, that's cool. So, uh, so what was your life like before Raven? Oh, geez. Well, me and Mark uh, were born here, where I am right now, Newcastle upon Tyne. Uh, blue collar working town uh, you know like life was pretty much in black and white uh, un until probably the 60s happened I guess when we were kids uh, and then you'd see crazy things on TV like uh, I remember as a kid seeing well one of my earliest memories is banging pots and pans to the Beatles <laughs> on a show called Thank Your Lucky Stars so it would be before the whole, uh, you know, when they came to America, like the year before or whatever. I remember seeing Hendrix on TV. There was a show called Top of the Pops, and they had so, you know, much garbage, but they also had all the good stuff. So by the time it hit 1970, it was Deep Purple, Atomic Rooster, Black Sabbath, and all this stuff. And, you know, it just went into your head. And we went on holiday as kids to Spain in like 71, 72, something like that. Maybe 72, I think. And there was, you know, it was one of these, you come down at 5.30 p.m. or you miss your Campbell's cream of tomato soup, the first item of international cuisine. And they had a band on. After the meal, they had a band, and it was a five-piece band, and the guitar player had a strat and a coiled cord and a wah-wah pedal and was playing with his teeth doing the whole Hendrix thing. We were, like, amazed because they were loud and they were really good, and it was very much a, I want to do that, you know? We were already playing our tennis rackets along the Slade and status quo, so it was a no-brainer. Mark got a classical guitar from that holiday, and we fought over it. And one day in 1974, Mark and the lad down the street, Paul Bowden, came up and said, we're going to form a band and you can play the bass. <laughs> and I was like, okay, we're in. Let's do it. And it's been wow. a wild ride ever since. Wow, that's wild. And and the, the name Raven, where does that even come from? Was it just one of you just came up no, with it? Or? We sat around the table and wrote lists of names and that was the name everyone hated the least 
and it, uh, it kind of worked out good because it's got many connotations but it's it's not like calling yourself kill your mother or something yeah. you know? <laughs> it's not like a yeah. like a millstone around your neck so that that's cool yeah yeah no that is cool so so what were the benefits of going from a four piece to a three piece uh they were many fold uh it made things more organic because going that way me mark and rob we were all writers and it, it really spurred a lot of creativity audio wise we all had greater real estate to cover uh it made mark blossom as a guitar player like within two weeks hmm. that was amazing uh and of course a lot of that's documented on the box set we put out last year from rock until you drop there's early demos there's a four piece and cool. then there's the demo we did in order to get the deal with neat records with three of the songs with slightly different arrangements but you can hear the progression all the way through which is pretty cool but uh the, the three piece thing initially was daunting because well like can you can we pull this off you know, because there's there's no passengers in a three piece. You've, yeah, you've you've all you've all got to be good, or you know, or it, it kind of sounds lame. Uh, but we had a, a lot of inspiration. Obviously, Rush, uh, Jimi Hendrix, even Emerson, Lake and Palmer. There was loads of acts wow. that were three pieces that were, you know, quite honestly brilliant. And it was like. Well, if they can do it, we can try. <laughs> so <laughs> we stepped out and, uh, you know, we, we just all went nuts. And it we came up with this thing where you'd write a song where there was uh, delineated parts. There was, you know, an intro, a verse, a chorus. But it wasn't just boom, boom, boom. There'd be left turns and crazy parts put in to spice it up, which is yeah. it's kind of our thing, you know. It's like... You hook people in with a, you know, like a great rhythm or a riff or a melody, and then you you get a little sick and twist around here and there to keep things interesting, which is, you know, because if it's all crazy and interesting all the time, then you're virgin and uh, jazz rock, and that's all yeah. great. And all. We we still want people to headbang and jump around, so you know. Totally cool. You did bring up a uh, neat records. So I do want to bring that up again. Uh, so what was your like introduction? <laughs> How so, what, what yeah, what was your introduction to Neat Records? Was it just we, we were playing a little show in Newcastle here as a, a music hall called Bambras, which is currently being renovated. Uh beautiful little place, tiny stage, and in the audience was a guy called Tom Noble who managed the Tigers of Pantang. Now, they were the first rock band to put a, a single out on Neat. Neat was just a yeah. custom label from a studio, and the first couple of singles were literally club bands that were just pressing stuff up to sell at the shows. You know, So they did a single, and they were smart. They sent a copy down to a rock magazine in London, and they loved it, and all of a sudden it started selling like hotcakes. So... We're playing this guy, Tom Noble, comes up afterwards, love the show. How would you guys like to do a single on Neat Records? Tom Noble from the yes. Tigers of Pantang, he's the guy who came up and said, do you want to do a single with Neat Records? And we said instantly, yes, let's do that. And we came in like a week later, and that demo that's on the box set of Don't Need Your Money, uh, what else is on there? Inquisitor, maybe, and Let It Rip, I believe. No, Wiped Out and Let It Rip. Mm. That was the, the demo, and it's just live to two-track. Just go and play and oh, record it. And they liked it. And let's do a single. Let's do Don't Need Your Money and Wiped Out. It's a, a double a side single. And that yeah. got a great reaction. And it was played by a guy called John Peel. He was a a very innovative DJ on Radio One in, in London. And his whole thing was just playing new music. So during the punk thing, he just like, here's a single from a band called the Sex Pistols, sir. Whoever they are, don't know, play it. He went, 
Who shot that fucking bear? I want him to open that for us. Yeah, it'd be really great, you know? <laughs> so, boom, we ended up on the, like, the first Blizzard of Oz tour. Yeah. Um, we, did, we did four dates with Ozzy, with Randy in the band. And then we were playing with White Snake and then with Iron Maiden and uh, Motorhead. Motorhead and all this kind of stuff. So literally, you know, six, seven months earlier, we were playing the working men's clubs in the northeast of England. <laughs> and then, boom, we were playing with people like that. How so, did that feel, like opening for Ozzy and Motorhead and stuff right at, like, so fast after putting out your first single? Yeah, but I mean, we, you know, at that point, we'd been playing in a band and playing gigs regularly for, yeah. you know, five years. So, mm. you know, we we had our apprenticeship. We knew what we were doing. Uh, so it was, uh, it was pinch me. We're really here, you know, it's, yeah. it's, it's happening. And we, we dealt with playing with crowds in the, the working men's clubs who were like, you know, openly, aggressively not liking you and having to win them over. So this was not a big deal for us. This was like, this is what we'd grown up on. You play a show and you have to connect. You have to try and get across what, what you are, what you're doing and entertain and, you know, do whatever to get people to pay attention and get a reaction. And yeah. so be it. If it happens to be a bad one, then you'd push them to make it worse. Yeah. Call them names <laughs> and antagonize them and make fun of it. Yeah. So it was uh, it was the opportunity we dreamed of to be able to play with people like that. And, you know, the claim it was, there's a change of the guard. It's the new wave of British heavy metal and all that. So, you know, we did very well. Yeah. And, and you know, led to the first album release rock until you drop what was the writing and recording process like for that record well we had you know a, a, as soon as rob joined we started writing 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 so we had a lot of songs we actually had a couple of the songs for the second album at that point wow. if you look at the uh, rock until you drop cover there's a set list and it's got chainsaw on it oh so really we were, we were already playing that back then wow uh, so, in, in fact, a, a couple of the songs we had, like Let It Rip and Inquisitor, we just said, well, they're already out. They're, you know, Let It Rip was on a compilation and Inquisitor was on another compilation. Like, well, let's do, and at the last minute, we added the medley with the two sweet songs, Hellraiser Action, because we grew up with the sweet, we loved the sweet, and a new song for the future. That was the last song that was recorded. And again, on that, since it was recorded over a period of about eight months, you know, like we got one day this week or one day in three weeks and bit bit by bit, uh, you can hear the band progressing through if, if you can figure out which ones were first. So, yeah, you know, Don't Need huh. Your Money, Nobody's Hero, Over the Top were like the earlier ones. And then, you know, the, the other songs came you know or at least were recorded a little later and in between of course we were gigging so we were you know gelling more as a band as the three of us obviously and brought more to cool. the table awesome and, and that album cover too is just crazy with all the instruments and everything yeah, was that in the this, studio uh, yeah it was a re our rehearsal place it was a kind of underground car park and it was kind of disgusting but we had this it was like a sliding big door and there was a room and we had all our stuff. It's that room. And the guy from Neat Records, Dave Wood, said, oh, I'm sending a photographer down because I had the idea for the cover. I was like, all right. So this guy walked in, his jaw hit the floor because he was a wedding <laughs> photographer, for God's sake. But he got into it and took a whole bunch of photos. And the shot that we picked is was obviously the right one. And yeah, it's uh, it basically... You know, it, it shouts what we are and what we were about. It, re it really matched the music perfectly. So Definitely. So what was your mindset going into the second record? Was it like, let's just be faster? Let's just it dial really everything was. up? It was, uh, let's just uh, up the ante in every possible way because we'd been, at that point, playing 
we'd, we'd went to Europe for the first time. We'd went to Italy and we'd went to the Netherlands and they were absolutely insane. These people, the crazy, crazy audiences. Cause, uh, you know, things are a lot more homogenized over the world now because of the internet and what have you. But back then, like the North of England was a tough crowd, but if they liked you, they went crazy. The mm. further south you went, they were more, oh, oh, you're very good. I really enjoy this, you know, <laughs> it's like with, this, with a stick jammed so far up their ass, you know. You could, you know <laughs> yeah. You could tickle their teeth, you know. <laughs> that, that really doesn't happen so much anymore now, thank goodness. But uh, there was no such, uh, you know, stuff going on in Italy and the Netherlands. The first gig we played in Italy, it was one of those divider walls like you would have at school to break a room in half. Oh, really? The dressing room was in there, and they tore the wall down. Oh, my God. Just to get at us at the end. It was it was mental. Wow, Jesus. So that was, that was exciting, going to do that. And so we had all that, and we saw what was feeding the beast, as it were. So it was like, okay, and we were writing more and more you know, crazy, amped up stuff. So we just say, oh, let's, let's let's go for that. Let's be as extreme as we can. Cool. What made you guys want to work with uh, Udo from Accept? Uh, well, we, you know, round about that period, we, it was right before, it's a bit of a long story, but right before we did Wiped Out, we did a Radio 1 session. Um, we did four songs with Tony Wilson the Radio 1 producer, and it was in a real studio because, you know, the Neat Studio wasn't a real studio. Yeah. There's a 16-track machine, a board, and an echo unit. <laughs> and that was it, you know? Yeah. Uh, so we went in one day, did four songs, mixed everything that sounded amazing. We were like, well, we're stuck with, you know, Neat for the Wiped Out album, but that's it. We'll never, We'll never do another one after that and mm. we'd argued the points and it was like we want a real producer and we want to go in a real studio so after getting that you know like fair enough okay okay who do you want we said well we love this band accept we'd heard the record breaker and we loved it and i think it was actually yeah it was in 82, we played a gig with them, and it was just before they brought out, or they were just bringing out Restless and Wild. We played a gig in Holland with them. Uh, no, it was in Belgium, in Bruges, and they mm. were great. And, you know, we, we got on with them, and it was just a question of, like, who's who did Breaker? And it turned out it was this guy, Michael Wagner, who was the engineer who got all the sounds. So we got in touch and it turned out that Michael was working with Voodoo as a, like a double act. It was double trouble productions. And we're like, okay, great. Bring him in. And immediately we said, well, we, we, we got to do a duet at some point with this crazy guy with his chainsaw voice. And yeah. Your chainsaw <laughs> voice. It'll be great. Yeah. We'll do that. So That's cool. we did like a week's worth of pre-production, uh, couple of miles down the road here and then went down to London to a little studio called Pineapple Studios right next to Southall Football Ground and spent about 15, 16 days there working ridiculous hours and it was such a great time. A lot of hard work but a lot of fun and it was a, a huge step forward for us. Things changed a bit with our album because we were like, well, you know, what are we going to do? just spiral into craziness. How much yeah. faster can you go? Let's explore some other angles of what we can do. So stuff was a little more open, a little more, you know, mid-paced, a lot of it, which worked out great live, especially the bigger places. It, it really, you know, we had such a great song that we still open with it many times, uh, Take Control. It's just, you know, Da, 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 and everyone's straight into it it's perfect yeah pretty uh, awesome the album came out great and of course we did uh force mr dirk schneider to sing born to be wild and a version of inquisitor <laughs> which was awesome yeah yeah pretty cool um so later you guys went to the states 
you had bands like Metallica open for you guys and other like up and coming thrash bands. What was it like touring with and, and seeing what America was doing with uh That was uh, this time we went to America was Halloween 1982. We played the Halloween Headbangers Ball, which is something this guy Johnny Z put together. Mm. We got in touch and said, I run the biggest import record store on the Eastern Seaboard, and I want you guys to come and play. And of course, his biggest store on the Eastern Seaboard was a little flea market place in New Jersey. But it was the biggest import store, it's it's for sure. Mm. And John was like a, a wild, you know, like a hellfire preacher. You know, I've come down from the mountain and I've heard heavy metal and I'm going <laughs> to spread it across the world. And he brought us over and we did that show and a bunch of others with uh, Anvil. And then mm. we came back, let's come back in 83 and, you know, do, do the whole thing, do a headline tour. Yeah, uh, so yeah, we had no this problem. opening band, these guys from California called Metallica. It was their first tour. And, you know, you had them, you had us, you had our crews. We had uh, Winnebago, two trucks, 17 people in a six-birth Winnebago. Brilliant. Uh, so obviously we spent half our time in the back of the truck after they destroyed the Winnebago, it wasn't very oh, much God. fun to be in half the time. So, but it was guerrilla warfare, and it was uh, it was awesome, and uh, it was probably the introduction to a lot of people of this kind of music, the more amped up, crazy heavy metal that we've all grown to know and love, you know. Totally. And then the year later, we did the same thing with Anthrax. We took them out on the first tour, so. You know, it's always been a, a thing we we try to get, uh, you know, great new bands out with us. Why not? Awesome. You know? And later you guys ended up playing with Metallica again in Brazil. What was that like? Well, that was really cool. Uh, we were doing dates in South America and our agent said, are you still in touch with Lars? And I said, well, he did a really great thing for the DVD we put out the year before. Uh I can probably reach him. Uh, what's the deal? And he says, well, they're playing some stadium gigs in South America. Let's see if we can open for them in Sao Paulo, which is the Moribundi Stadium, which is like 70,000 people. Yeah. So I'm like, uh, you know, getting in touch with their people saying, hi, yeah, can you ask Lars if we can open for them in Sao Paulo? And he's like, Lars says yes. I'm like, what <laughs> that was uh you know because we've had many many experiences where such and such is going to happen and the first few times you're like, yeah <laughs> and after a while you're like yeah, yeah. Right, yeah right yeah right so this was the first one in whatever 25 years where we were like yeah because it was it was real it was going to happen and it was amazing uh the funny thing was People were feeding into this huge place all day. All they were playing was a 30-second ad for the movie Metallica had, the uh, Through the Nether. Yeah. And they weren't playing music at all. And the place hmm. just filled up. It was like a powder keg ready to go off. And we were only going to be playing like 30 minutes. And they said, Metallica are delayed, so you're not going on yet. Uh, and I said, we can play longer. <laughs> said, really? I said, oh, yeah, we can play longer. He says, well, we'll see. And it waited because I think we were due to go on at seven. I don't think we went on until about quarter to eight. It was dark. Wow. And when the lights went down on that stage, it was the loudest sound I've ever heard. It was absolutely <laughs> deafening. Just because wow. built up, you know, they'd been waiting and waiting. And we went out and we went down great. It was great, great gig for us. And right near the end, we're like, uh, can we do one more? And the guy gives a thumbs up. So, you know, we do break the chain with all the associated jamming, which is about 15 minutes long. And we got away with it because James is on stage videoing us, giving us a thumbs up. <laughs> That's awesome. We got, we got to hang out with them for about uh, 15, 20 minutes before they went on. It was really cool. It was really good of them to do that. That's really of awesome. Course, we just recently did kind of the same thing again in Florida uh, last November. Uh, they asked us to come down and play a show with them there, which was awesome as well. It was a lot of fun. That was a tribute for John and Marsha Zazula. 
wow. who were all managers and you know their managers all managers and anthrax and a lot of other people and uh, it was uh, just a great way to acknowledge that you know yeah yeah that's that's so cool and and it's really cool to see you guys almost taking care of each other you know you taking metallic on the road metallica bringing you to brazil or whatever and even that florida gig sounds interesting too oh definitely it was uh yeah check it out there's lots of videos 100 percent. yeah and, um, uh, no i mean you know i've got a lot of respect for those guys because they've you know they've been through the mill they've been very very successful and I'm sure they've had the period where it all went to their head and went away again. They got through that. Uh, we can barely imagine what it's like to deal with that level of success. You know, it's it's a very strange thing and very hard to navigate. And I, I think they should be proud of themselves the way they have done that because when we talk to them, it's the same guys. You know, and that, that's that's pretty special. I would say that's pretty special. You know. Yeah. No, it it really is. And that's really awesome to hear from you. Um, so, you know, I don't want to whiplash you too much, but I just want to talk about the Atlantic Records period uh, no, for a little uh, bit. We had, um, obviously, the intention after 83 to come back in 84 and tour until we got a major agent deal and a major label deal. Yep. And, you know, we played this one show, and I think it was August in New York, with us headlining Metallica in the middle, Anthrax opened. And, you know, three unsigned bands sold out Roseland, which was like 3,500, wow. 4,000 people. It was a huge deal. It was a load of record companies there. We got signed to Atlantic. Metallica got signed to Electra. And Anthrax Jeez. got signed to Ireland from, from all of that. Uh and we were so happy because, you know, Atlantic, it's Led Zeppelin, it's ACDC. Yeah. Well, it was also staffed with a bunch of brain-dead morons. Yeah. <laughs> and we, we found out the hard way, you know? Yeah. So, so, so we what had was... the record uh -huh. basically half, three-quarters done. And then when we got the deal, it was like, because initially the record was going to be to get off neat records. So we'd held a few songs back once we got the deal, you know, songs like on and on and get it right came back onto the record. So, so that's that the record came out pretty much the way we wanted it. You know, uh, it was the next record to pack this back where there was a lot of pressure to be more commercial, a lot of things being done behind the band's back, like uh, those clean guitar tracks, make them louder. Uh, you know, <laughs> Make oh, it sound more like that. And, you know, we kind of shot ourselves in the foot too. And, um, you know, a, a lot of it was basically how not to do a record. We, we got the guy who's known for having like a, a live sound in the studio, Eddie Kramer. And we were all going for this kind of high tech heavy metal thing, high tech pop metal, whatever. Mm. Uh, which is why, of course, it sounds parallel to turbo by judas priest it's yeah very, um to the point that uh. we've got the same bloody synthesizer guitar sounds on some of it and the whole thing you know yeah so it was a, it was a learning period because we did all this it cost a fortune it took forever and then it was like okay we've got these great plans to do a video and the record company went no mm. like what so you make us build this giant ship and you're not going to put it in the ocean, basically. And yeah. we had a lot of a lot of meetings and soul searching and said, basically, uh, fuck you, is what we said. We're, we're going to regroup. We had a tour coming up with Twisted Sister. Uh, and that was their Nightmare album, Come Out, Come Out and Play, mm. uh, which got cancelled about a week before they went out. And we yes. were on the tour. And we recorded an EP called Mad, which was pretty much a return to form. And yes. we just ended up touring ourselves with that. And the, the other issue we had, although in that year, 86, we played a bunch of gigs with Judas Priest because we were on the same agent agency deal with a premier talent. Um, there was a lot of fighting between talent agencies and you know booking agencies. And the one agent that had all the metal bands we hadn't signed with. Therefore, they didn't want us to open for any other bands. Therefore, we were hamstrung. 
in the plane with Judas Priest or Journey or by ourselves. And Journey didn't wow. want us. It's just Judas Priest. So we had to go cap in hand and say, sorry, we need to quit. We need to sign with this other company, which we did. And our last tour of Rob was with uh, Wasp and Slayer, which we did in 87, along with the Life's a Bitch album, which was our FU album to Atlantic, pretty much, which is uh, it's a great record. Very angry, but a great record. And yeah. I brought that part of our career to a close at the end of the tour pretty much we we were like let's do a show for the record company it's like a showcase bring them all in in new york and they all came in four hours early and left early oh my god and that told us everything we needed to know wow so following that rob quit the bands and we negotiated a bye-bye with atlantic and then we started looking for a new drummer, you know, and we ended up trying a few guys out, which didn't work. And then it was like, why don't we try Joe? Joe was playing in a band called Savoy Brown. He was a friend of ours. We knew he liked the same kind of music we did. We knew he was a great drummer and brought him down for rehearsal and boom, it clicked. And off we were again, you know? Cool. Awesome. Yeah. That's, that's really interesting to hear. Um, I also want to touch upon this. You guys, your imagery was like wearing sports gear and whatnot. Is that because a label called you guys like Athletic Rock? Or where does that come from? That was that's on the first single. Yeah. Uh, Neat Records that said Athletic Rock from Neat because we were wearing running tops. That was it. There wasn't uh, oh. <laughs> the hockey helmets and pads and stuff because we got all that after we'd seen it in America. You couldn't get that in Newcastle. Uh but it's we were like athletic rock. Well, whatever, you know. Yeah. Still our name right. I don't care as long as it makes us sound different to somebody else. But it made sense. There was a lot of energy in the music, and you know, a lot of energy in the live show, of course. So why not? Yeah. So so we were talking about the Atlantic period. So after Atlantic, what made you guys? Uh, how do you get in touch with Combat? Combat Records. Uh we did a demo. Mm -hmm. and shopped it around and they were interested they came down watched the rehearsal and said yeah let's do that they had a name in the underground it was like uh you know like another mega force or another neat or what have you and it seemed to make sense uh, again there was some uh you know some real graduates of yale working in that place you know like <laughs> but uh you know, we want to do a video. Well, you can only do a video if you do this Ultimate Revenge 2 thing, which was, for us, it was an absolute nightmare. It, you know, what you see came out okay, but the day was a disaster. It was awful. Really? Um, yeah, well, they put us in a hotel, didn't tell us what time we had to get up, and they'd forgotten which rooms we were in. Oh, my God. So at, like, 10.30, <laughs> we're getting banged on the doors. You guys need to be sound-checking now. We're, like, for a show that's going on at, like, 10 o'clock at night? <laughs> yeah, you freaking mind. So they drag wow. us there, and all, all the other bands are standing there going, oh, look at these guys. They think they're rock stars because they turn up late. They say, oh, God, here we go. So we had wow. And then the board wasn't working, so our sound man had to disassemble some of the channels and make it work. And again, it was like, oh, they're just wasting time. And, and you know, this shit went on forever. And then at the end, it was like, okay, we're hungry. Can we eat? No, all the other bands have ate all the food. Oh, my God. What a disaster. So we were really riled up and full of piss and vinegar. So we played well. Uh, so we got that down. Yeah. Uh, but it, but oh. it, eventually, what they, they would, you know, it was edited live. There was no editing afterwards. The audio was done. We had no control over anything. So, by surreptitious means, we ended up with the master tapes, which are safely hidden away. So, if it ever comes out, it's going to be from us. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Good to know. Yeah. So, uh, so you guys put out Architect of Fear, which was one of the heaviest records you guys ever put out. Was this a reaction to your more commercial sound before? Well, actually, the, the next record with that one, we, oh, yeah, that was Nothing Exceeds Excess. It was a mm -hmm. tight budget, a small studio. 
and we got the offer to go to Europe and play with Creator. And it'd been cool. the first time back in Europe for like five years, and that was awesome. So we hooked up with Creator's management, and it was like, yeah, let's do a record here in Germany. Yeah. So all things German were heavy, and it, <laughs> it reflected in the music. Uh, so yeah, it, it's it's definitely a, a heavy album with a big bombastic sound to it, and it was uh, really cool to do. Uh, like this crazy yeah. engineer who found out there was too much bass in the mix and he got drunk and was flailing around on the floor going, I cannot believe, I cannot believe. <laughs> but it all it all worked out in the end. And then we did a tour there with uh, Running Wild, a uh, pretty big tour in Europe, which was cool. And we cool. did another one in 92. And by that point, the grunge explosion had started to hit Europe and things started getting pretty shitty there too. So we started working on another record, uh, which got delayed because my house burned down and lost a lot of tapes. And Jesus, really? Got stolen out of the wreck and all the rest of it. Your house burned down, you said? Yeah. Um, was it like an electrical thing? or It was. There was a power cut, and my mother-in-law at the time had put a cooler with the stuff out the fridge on top of the stove. Oh, no. But the stove came back on when we were out of the house and we driving back and we see this column of smoke and I'm like, I bet that's our house. And it was. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> so the garage Jeez. was still in one piece. We put a lot of stuff in and locked it away. And through the night, people broke in and stole like four or five guitars off me. Oh, and all this other shit. So uh, that's awful. And you learn the you learn the hard way that all that things is just stuff. Yeah. yeah, it's just stuff. You can always get stuff. You can't get people, but you can get stuff. So mm -hmm. we regrouped and we ended up doing the Glow record and got a yes. deal in Japan for it. And that was a uh, a little different, uh, since Architect of Fear was very one minded. One thing we just yeah, let's try a bit of this. Let's try a bit of this. So. It's, couple of more experimental things on and i think by and large it worked well the sound was awesome there was a studio called showplace in dover new jersey uh guy ben elliott wonderful engineer did a great job on it and the funny thing about the studio was it was really beautiful old woods and panels and stuff and we said we used to we played this place back in you know 1982 he says, yeah, he says, follow me. And there was a big door, you know, like your way and opens it. And there's a cupboard with tapes and tools and shit. And then there's another door. And then you walk into the strip club. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> yeah, so it was really difficult rounding people up to listen to mixes. Let me tell you. <laughs> oh, no, they're in there again. <laughs> Oh my Pretty god! Funny. Wow, Pretty that's funny. so funny. So, but, so yeah, so glow. That came out. We, we, like, we, like I say, we got the deal in Japan, and we got to go to Japan for the first time, which was pretty incredible. So that's why it only came out in Japan then, because Glow yeah, never came out anywhere Japan, else. And it, it eventually came out in Europe on, a, I believe, a subsidiary of SPV. I don't think it came out in. No, I don't think it came out in the states at all. No, you're right. Yeah. Uh, and again, it was that time where heavy metal was a dirty word, pretty much. And, you know, it was all things grunge and new metal and whatever, you know? Yeah. Unfortunately, it did kill a lot of thrash metal bands in the 90s. Of course, Metallica found their way around it. But unfortunately, some of these bands just couldn't adapt. Um, no. And it's, I mean, we'd, we'd been through this when we were kids. We'd played the clubs and everything was wonderful. And then punk came along. And you couldn't get arrested and you just <laughs> had to work harder so this is what we did you know things got tough move here got tough work here work, work wherever you can you know and things started turning around again around about 97 uh in europe at, at least and we had a great tour then we had the record everything louder which was done on a budget of about 38 dollars and 58 cents i think oh my god 
uh, we, we did it in four weekends. Boom, 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 boom. Wow. Um, but uh, it's, you know, the songs and the playing kick, kick ass on it. So that was, that was a great, a great album for us. I think I liked it. And we, we did a great tour with uh, Hell, or, no, was it uh, Hammerfall? It was their first tour. Um, wow. Because they were, the, they were the bright young things right then. That was their first tour. And the funny thing was the Germanic style of heavy metal was dead, but a band from wherever they're from, Sweden or Norway, brought it back to them and they loved it. So, you know. Yeah. And we, and also Tank, our old friends Tank were on the bill. So it was a great bill. We had a lot of fun doing that it. That sounds amazing, man, With especially with Tank on there as well. Yeah, man. It was, it was awesome. It was really, really cool. So and awesome. we did that. We had some downtime. We started writing, and my dad died in two thousand one. We went to the funeral. I flew back on September tenth, and my brother flew back on September eleventh, and ended up with a three week forced stay in Canada because it was. Oh my 11th. god. What a nightmare he, week for you that was. And when he got back, oh god, he needed, some, he needed some money from somebody that owed him it, and he went to the job site to get it. And he'd had an accident; he had a big lump on his head, so he couldn't wear the hard hat. So he had his baseball cap on, and it was windy, and they were building a Walgreens, huge drugstore. Yeah. So the wind blows his hat off. He goes to get the hat, and the wind blows the hat again, and he goes to get the hat. And then the building falls down on top of him. What? And if the if he hadn't have had the accident and had the hard hat on, he wouldn't have kept chasing the hat. As it was, the building fell on his legs. It would have fell on him and crushed him to death completely. Wow. So I get a phone call with him giggling, going, oh, a building fell on me. Oh. I'm like, yeah, you're drunk again, aren't you? Yes, thank you. Goodbye, Clint. <laughs> and he was just, uh, you know, a adrenaline shock craziness he got helicoptered out and they thought he was going to die due to blood loss and the injuries and then it was like we're going to have to cut your legs off and he told them f off i'm not doing that and then well we're going to have to cut your right leg off no you're not doing that well you'll never walk again watch me and you know it's like four years later He's on stage with a leg brace. Wow. Um, and the leg brace has got smaller and smaller to the point where, you know, he's still got residual damage, but you would never really know. You know? Yeah. That's that's wild to hear. You know, he could have had no legs his entire life. But he's yeah, like, no, I mean, he actually did like it. maybe four shows with him in a wheelchair, and it was really weird. Mm. And he just had an operation a few weeks before. So he plays one song and stops. Throws up all over the ground, wipes his mouth, and then goes back into the roof. <laughs> oh, God. Totally Dude. in it. <laughs> Guy shouts, that's rock and roll! <laughs> Hell yeah, it is. That's awesome. Uh, so, Raven, ex extensive history. So, what are your favorite memories of being in Raven? Any pinpoint memories? Oh, there's so many. Can you tell the, me? Oh, uh, yeah? You know, the, the first time... We played the Mayfair Ballroom in Newcastle. That was the, the two big halls was that and the City Hall, doing them. But things like getting your first record, doing a record, that was a big deal. Oh, doing yeah. an album was a huge deal. We finally had a hold of Rotten Till You Drop. Going to Europe, going to the States, and then there's so many firsts still. I mean, uh, we went to Australia a couple of years ago for the first time. We've, we've done... You know, relatively recently, South America. I think we started going about ten years ago. I think amazing, and Japan, of course, is always phenomenal. We actually did China in two thousand nineteen, which was very weird. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah, it's it's, it's awesome cool. though. I've yeah. heard great things about it. It's always cool to do new new places and play to a new audience. You know. Yeah. Um, and you know, recently we've been doing the you know over the last ten years or so we've been doing the rock cruises, which are awesome. It's a lot of fun. You get to hang out with uh, the fans. It's it's very you know it's great on an interpersonal level, and 
you know, and and playing the playing the festivals, which was a thing that really wasn't much of a thing back in the day, but since like 2010 onwards, doing the festivals is always awesome. Yeah, and, and they're huge now, and it's really cool. And and we were talking about the '90s, but I feel like you guys almost you kind of went through that membrane where now metal is very loved and accepted, and it's bigger than grunge <laughs> now. Yeah, and I mean, and, and we've uh, you know we've we, we're getting kind of the respect we deserve. I mean, we were inducted into the Heavy Metal Hall of Fame in January, which was uh, came out of left field, came out of very nowhere. deserved. Yeah. It's awesome. That's uh, you know, it's you know, very nice to have people recognize you in anything like that. That's it was very cool. Yeah, yeah. And were Raven? Were you guys ever big partiers on the road, or was it tame? Oh, we, nah. I never did nothing. My oh, brother yeah. let me drink to the point where he lined up the whiskey bottles in the hotel room on the on the windowsill and looked at them and said, "I'm done." <laughs> I'm done <enough." laughs> And and yeah. that was basically it for him. Uh, I th I think Rob probably uh, was the wild man of the bunch here and there, and uh, probably one of the reasons why he quit the band is he had to get away from it before yeah. it uh, took over him, you know. Uh, but you know this, we we try to keep the craziness on stage. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> where it belongs. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome, man. So uh, as we wrap up here, uh, what's the best way for fans to keep in touch with the band and Raven and everything? Well, you got the, I'm on Facebook, uh, John Gallagher Raven and official Raven, uh, official Raven on uh, Instagram, uh, ravenlunatics.com. Uh, we're all on that stuff. The new album, All Hell's Breaking Loose, is going to be out on Silver Lining Records on June, June 30th. 30th. And uh, we may well have a new video coming out in about, oh, I don't know, a couple more weeks. Let's see. Very exciting. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, I can't tell you anything more than that, but watch All out. All right, cool. Awesome, video. awesome. Well, uh, well, John, thank you so much for joining me here. Really appreciate thank it, you, man. man. I appreciate it. Awesome. I'm Brandon Baddock, and this is Disturbing the Priest.